Hey everyone, welcome back to another video here on Try Hack Me. I'm John, and today we'll be taking a look at the room, putting it all together. Learn how all the individual components of the web work together to bring you access to your favorite websites. Let's dive into task one, putting it all together. From the previous modules, you have learned quite a lot of things that go on behind the scenes when you make a request to a web page in your browser. To summarize, when you request a website, your computer needs to know the server's IP address it needs to talk to, and for this, it uses DNS, or the domain name system. Your computer then talks to the web server using a special set of commands called the HTTP protocol, and then the web server returns HTML, JavaScript, CSS, images, and so on and so forth, which your browser uses to correctly format and display the website to you. And here we can see that we have the request here, we are finding the actual IP with DNS, we connect to the actual web server that we want to talk to, and then we can view the website, which sent back the information to us. There are also a few other components that help the web run more efficiently and provide extra features. We'll go ahead and mark this as completed and move into task two, other components. We'll go ahead and close that. First, we have load balancers. When a website's traffic starts getting quite large or is running an application that needs to have high availability, one web server might be no longer enough to do the job. Load balancers provide two main features ensuring high traffic websites can handle the load and providing a failover if a server becomes unresponsive. This happens a lot, and that's something that, especially if you get into web dev, you're going to start seeing that high availability is very important. When you request a website with a load balancer, the load balancer will receive your request first and then forward it to one of the multiple servers behind it. The load balancer uses different algorithms to decide which server is best to deal with the request. A couple of examples of these algorithms are round robin, which sends it to each server in turn, or weighted, which checks how many requests a server is currently dealing with and sends it to the least busy server. Load balancers also perform periodic checks with each server to ensure that they are running correctly. This is called a health check, and this is often referred to as a heartbeat to make sure that it's still running. That's something that if you ever get into VMware or virtual machines on an enterprise scale, you'll see a lot of that come up especially with AWS as well. If a server doesn't respond appropriately or doesn't respond in, at all, the load balancer will stop sending traffic until it responds appropriately again. Next we have CDNs, or Content Delivery Networks. A CDN can be an excellent resource for cutting down traffic to a busy website. It allows you to host static files from your website, such as JavaScript, CSS, images, videos, and so on and so forth, and host them across thousands of servers all over the world. When a user requests one of the hosted files, the CDN works out where the nearest server is physically located and sends the request there instead of potentially the other side of the world, because that's going to take a lot longer. Even though the internet's pretty fast, that's still a long time for the request. Uh, if you want a really good example of this, Amazon's CloudFront is a CDN, and I believe Netflix leverages that. Uh, think of it for Netflix's videos. This is how it knows to send you to a server that's near you. So if you are right next to London in the UK, you will have your request sent to London, uh, a data farm there, rather than somewhere else, maybe in you know the United States. Next, we have databases. Often websites will need a way of storing information for their users. Websites can communicate with databases to store and recall data from them. Databases can range from just a simple plain text file up to complex uh, clusters of multiple servers, providing speed and resilience. You'll come across some common databases, such as MySQL, MSQL or Microsoft SQL, MongoDB, GraphQL, Postgres, and many more. Each has its own specific features, and it's really meant for a specific type of application. Next, we have WAFs or web application firewalls. A WAF sits between your web request and a web server. Its primary, primary purpose is to protect the web server from hacking or denial of service attacks. A good example of this is actually Cloudflare. It analyzes the web requests for common attack techniques, whether the request is from a real browser rather than a bot, and it will also check if an excessive amount of web requests are being sent by utilizing something called rate limiting which will only allow a certain amount of requests from an IP per second. If a request is deemed a potential attack, it will be dropped and never sent to the web server. Let's take a look at the questions below. What can be used to host static files and speed up clients that visit a website? That is a CDN or a content delivery network. What does a load balancer perform to make sure a host is still alive? That is a health 
Let's see. I believe it's health check specifically in this case. There we go. What can be used to help against the hacking of a website? That is a WAP or a web application firewall. Let's move into task three, how web servers work. What is a web server? A web server is a software that li listens for incoming connections and then utilizes the HTTP protocol to deliver web content to its clients. The most common web software or web server software you'll come across is Apache, Nginx, IAS, or uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember the uh, what that expands to. This is the Microsoft uh, web server. This is something that if you have a Windows server, you will see this as an install option, and then Node.js. A web server delivers files from what's called its root directory, which is defined in the software settings. So for example, Nginx and Apache share the same default location of var www forward slash HTML, common location to end up in if you're doing web hacking and get a shell on the server in Linux operating systems. And IAS uses C colon uh, backslash inet pub backslash www root for the Windows operating systems. So for example, if you requested the file HTTP forward slash, and it looks like we're looking for a picture.jpg file, it would send the file var www html picture.jpg from its local hard drive. And this just specifies since we don't have any other folders at the end of the actual domain, this is from the root of the web server. Next we have virtual hosts. Web servers can host multiple websites and that's very common with different domain names. To achieve this, they use virtual hosts. The server software checks the host name being requested from the HTTP header and matches that against its virtual hosts. Virtual hosts are just text-based configuration files. If it finds a match, the correct website will be provided. If no match is found, the default website will be provided instead. Virtual hosts can have their root directory mapped to different locations on the hard drive. For example, one.com being mapped to var www website underscore one, and two being mapped to var www website underscore two. There's no limit to the number of websites you can host on a web server, other than performance. If you start hosting too many, it might come to a crawl. Static versus dynamic content. Static content, as the name suggests, is content that never changes. Common examples of this are pictures, JavaScript, CSS, and so on and so forth, but can also include HTML that never changes. For example, or furthermore, these are files that are directly served from the web server with no changes made to them. Dynamic content, on the other hand, is content that could change with different requests. Take, for example, a blog. On the home page of the blog, it will show you the latest entries. If a new entry is created, the home page will, is then updated with the latest entry. Or a second example might be a search page on a blog. Depending on what words you search for, different results will be displayed. These changes, uh, these change what you end up seeing and what are done in the back end is, <laughs> these changes to what you end up seeing are done in what is called the back end with the use of programming and scripting languages. It's called the back end because what is done is all behind the scenes. And this happens outside of what we would actually see on the front end, which is the client side. You can't view the website's HTML source and see what's happening in the back end, while the HTML is the result of processing from the back end. Everything you see in your browser is called the front end. Scripting in backend languages. There's not much of a limit to what a backend language can achieve, and these are what make a website interactive to the user. Some examples of these languages, in no particular order, are PHP, Python, Ruby, Node.js, Perl, and many more. These languages can interact with databases, call external services, process data from the user, and so much more. A basic PHP example of this would be if you requested the website example.com forward slash index.php with a parameter of name equals Adam. If index.php was built like this, so we're looking for the parameter on the git request for name, and we can see that up here, we're going to go ahead and have hello and then the actual name reflected back to the client. And we can see that right here. You'll notice that the client doesn't see any PHP code because it's on the back end. This interactivity opens up a lot more security issues for web applications that haven't been created securely, as you'll learn in further modules. What does web server software used for to host multiple sites? That is virtual hosts. What is the name for the content uh, that I can change, or that can change rather? 
that is dynamic. Does the client see the backend code? And that is going to be nay. We do not see the backend code. Let's move into the final task, task four, quiz. Click the view site button on the right. We'll go ahead and get that and we can close out of that. And then using everything you've learned from the other modules, drag and drop the tiles into the correct order of how a request works to reveal the flag. Note when placing a title in the correct position, it will highlight in green. When a tile is in the wrong spot, it will highlight in red. Make sure not to refresh the page as it will reset the tiles to blank again. Let's see. So the first thing that we want to do, and we can actually make this a little bit easier on ourselves and go up to the first task. And we can see that we've got some hints here. So let's see, we have the request in your web browser and that should be number one. So we're making that request. And then next, this is gonna to go to the recursive DNS server for checking for that address. Actually, that might be later on. Let me go ahead and let's see, should check our local cache first. I'm gonna go ahead and pause, I'll put these all in order and we'll be right back. All right, and we're back. So let's go ahead and walk through this process and we'll go ahead and open this up. First, we have our request uh, to tryhackme.com in the browser. It's gonna check our local cache for the IP address to see if we've already made this recently because why send the request if we don't need to? Next, if it's not found locally, it'll check our recursive DNS server for the address. The DNS server will then query the root server to find the authoritative DNS server. The authoritative DNS server advises the IP for the website, then the request, the actual request that we've sent, passes through the web application firewall, and then it passes to a load balancer, and then it'll finally connect to the website on port 80 or 443. Next, the web server receives the GET request. The web server itself, or the web application, is going to talk to its database to see if there's anything that it needs for like dynamic content or if you're authenticating, and then the request is sent back to your browser, which will render the HTML into a viewable website. After completing this, you should get a little pop-up and that'll have your flag. I'll go ahead and put that down there. And there we go. That's gonna do it for this room. If you have any questions, as always, the Try Hack Me Discord and the subreddit will be linked in the video description below. But until next time, happy hacking.